Okay, so this is this is a presentation uh, by Yiming Zhao, who's a who's a postdoc in, in my group actually. Um, he um, he published a study he's going to present now last week in Nature Communications, so we're very excited about this. So thank you, William, for introduction, and then uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a work we done at Timi, and uh, I'm very happy that it got published last week. And so I can use the title here. Uh, called Augmenting Drug Carrier Compatibility Improves Tumor Nanotherapy Efficacy. So um, after the nice talk of Anna, so I don't think I need to explain what is uh, cancer nanotherapy, but I do want to um, uh, guide you go through the delivery process of nanoparticle. So um, as we know that nanoparticle have many advantage properties compared to small molecule drugs, that it's a it can circulate longer, it can have some targeting effect. So that's why we want to put drug, some molecule drugs into the nanoparticle and then administrative, uh, administration into the uh, vasculature, uh, sorry, to the circulation. And hopefully, and I say hopefully, the nanoparticle will bring the drug to the tumor due to the leaky vasculature. And also finally internalize into the uh, tumor cells and then get released there to kill out the cancer. Um, Obviously, it's very important that the nanoparticle should go to the go to the tumor. That's why people do a lot of effort to investigate on this. Um, but another important requirement that also need people always uh, uh, neglect that is we need to make sure the drug has to be always stay with the nanoparticle. But in real case, and sometimes this is just an assumption. Um, in order to make it uh, easier to understand, I say the, the problem, let's say this is our nanoparticle, and this is a drug that is carried on nanoparticle, and we want it to be delivered to the tumor here. So um, you have a GPS, you have good navigation, and you're sure that you, your ship can go to the harbor. But we should remember this is not a peaceful world. So on your, on half a way, you're gonna meet a parrot. Those power in real life, this is the uh, circulation, uh, the plasma proteins. They're gonna take your drug away and then ship it to a place that you don't want. And what you have in the end is your, your nanoparticle and any bit tumor, but the drug is gone. So in order to look detail into this problem and also to understand how the drug and carrier compatibility will affect the release of the, uh, the drug, that's why we need a new tool to monitor the nanoparticle dr drug release, especially in the vivo. That's why we use fluorescent resonance and in transfer we call it FRET here. That's how we build up the nanoparticle. We choose a very, uh, very, very popular nanoparticle that's a PLGA pack. This is now in the clinical trial, and then uh, this basically is formed by a block of polymer which has a PLJ hydrophobic part and a PEG um, hydrophilic part. It will self-assemble into a nanoparticle forming a hydrophobic core. If we have a drug here, uh, which is poorly water soluble, it will incorporate physically into the core of the nanoparticle. If we here label the nanoparticle by conjugate, uh, do not die on the polymer chain, and then, uh, and then have an uh, accepted dye on the drug, because they are close in distance in the core, we're gonna have any transfer from a green to the red dye, then we then have the thread. Uh, uh, here we use green and red, but actually we use a near infrared dye to have uh, near infrared imaging possible. Here we made a, a, a small video to explain um, the mechanism. So this is our nanoparticle, which is labeled by the green dye, and the drug is labeled by the red dye. If we excite it, the green uh, dye, it have N transfer to the red dye, then we see the red emission. But if the drug slowly release out of nanoparticle, yeah, and we excite it again, the green dye, in this case, there's no threat because distance is so far. And this way, we can only see the green luminescence from the nanoparticle. So by this way, we can uh, probe in real time uh, how much drug is released out of nanoparticle. Okay, um, we want to investigate problems systematically. That's why uh, uh, we want to check how the compatibility between the drug and the carrier affect the release process. And there are two key parameters here. 
one is hydrophobicity of the drug. It uh, um, basically tells how drug is insoluble in water. Another important factor is the uh, miscibility of the drug with a polar matrix that's represented by the following Huygens uh, parameters, which basically means uh, how the drug and the polymer like each other. So by rationally derivatize the structure of the dimole uh, which is based on size 7 dye molecules, we can fine tuning these two properties. And first, we do some computer simulation works, try to understand how uh, the drug property change, how it affect their loading positions, and how it affect their uh, interactions with the nanoparticle. And basically, the results shows here, which information tell, tells us is, if the drug is not very miscible with the nanoparticle, they will basically most likely to localize on the surface of the PLGA core, which is directly exposed to the water. Um, of course, when it's become more hydrophobic, the binding, the binding force of the drug and the particle will be stronger. It's just like they are more sticky on the nanoparticle. Only in case they are very miscible with the uh, polymer core, they tend to uh, uh, homogeneous distribu distributed uh, in the core. And in that way, actually, this is better protected by the nanoparticle. So we we'll move to the uh, real experiment. Um, we, we, we have to notice here that all these particle carrying drugs, they are pretty stable in PBS. But once you drew into FB, uh, uh, serum, that's here, it is FB, uh, FBS here, the drug turned to release out very fast. And we find that uh, there are two factors determining the, drug, uh, the rate of drug release. First is coming from the drug carrier itself. Basically, if it's more compatible, which means either more hydrophobic or more miscible with the polar matrix, they will have slower release. And another important factor is in the environmental factors. Uh, that depends on, for example, the serum protein concentration. The protein here uh, could be HDL and uh, albumin. Basically, this is a power scale. If you have more powers, of course, they are rubbed faster. And second is uh, uh, factor is the temperature. When temperature is higher, obviously, all dynamic processes are uh, faster. Oh, here is another video to show uh, how we can use this uh, in vivo. So here we have a mice bearing tumor. And then we inject the colorful nanoparticles into the circulation. And then it will circulate well and end up in the tumor. And if they carry a drug associated, we should appreciate the red signal from the drug. But if their uh, drug slowly rises out, then we can only see uh, the green emission from the, from the dye. Actually, from, from the color change, in the end, we can see uh, how much uh, when, well, and how much, how fast a drug release out. And here bring some real data. Um, this is by uh, near infrared imaging, and uh, look at the drug release. Um, if we look at the FRED channel, which basically means how much energy transfer are there, we're, we're going to see when the drug start to release out, this intensity will start to fade. And here is a quantification of the uh, uh, FRED intensity, which will present how fast the drug release. Uh, as we can see here, more compatible uh, drug to the carrier, they tend to release slower and over a longer period of time. Uh, we can use the same technique using the, uh, but using intravital microscopy to uh, visualize the drug release in the circulation. And you can see um, all, these, all these particles, different kind of drug, they always get rubbed by the, by, by the serum, but in different degrees. And um, most important thing here is how fast the release and how much the retained uh, stay on a drug. Because that's important to bring us to the next is the tumor deliver efficiency. If the drug and carrier, they turn to dissociate during the circulation, and the direct result will be, well, uh, your nanoparticle and drug probably have different biodistribution. As you can see here, uh, no matter what drugs uh, the nanoparticle carries, it can have identical uh, biodistribution uh, just because well, it's uh, the same particle. However, if you look at the drug distribution, they are really different from each other and pay uh, 
attention to the tumor here, we tend to see that when the drugs are more compatible with uh, the uh, particle, it tend to have more uh, tumor accumulation just simply because they lose less drug during the circulation. And if we plot uh, the carrier concentration and the drug concentration in the, in the tumor, we're going to see a uh, better correlation for the more hydrophobic or more miscible drugs because, uh, because the drug followed the carrier better in this way. So as a sum up of all the observations, we can uh, make a guideline for efficient nanoparticle delivery. So if we plot the miscibility and hydrophobicity in one plot, we can identify a red region and a blue region. The in the, in the, if the drug sits in the red region, which means it turns to have fast release uh, from the particle during circulation and end up with uh, a less tumor accumulation. Uh, if in the blue region is to the opposite, they retain better with another particle and drug will be delivered more in the tumor. So what will drop? It's gonna be, uh, we need to make the drug more compatible. So it's, it's move from the red region to the blue region. So all of these are, looks nice so far, but this all work is based on drug models. And so we want to test if this guideline really used for, for uh, real therapeutic. That's why I choose a, a clinical use drug rubicin, which is also a very classic uh, anti-tumor agent. And we do a derivatize, different derivatize of the uh, drug rubicin uh, to, uh, to change its hydrophobicity or miscibility to check how it affects the delivery and how it would affect the uh, therapeutic. Uh, well, you may uh, argue here, well, if you change the structure of the drug, it may also uh, affect its function. So that's why we came up with a pro-drug approach and that all of these pro-drugs, when they end up into the tumor, which is an acidic environment, the tail part of the pro-drug will be cleaved and generating the same doxorubicin. So in this case, uh, the structure of the drug doesn't matter anymore. Anything matters is, is how much uh, drug is delivered to the tumor. So we put those pro-drugs into the nanoparticle and then inject into tumor mice. And indeed, we see uh, for, for a more hydrophobic drug and more miscible uh, drug, they tend to have better tumor accumulation. And this will lead to also better anti-tumor efficacy, uh, better suppress of the tumor growth here, as you see here, and also prolong the uh, uh, survival of the mice. So uh, this will bring to the end of the story. So um, from the beginning, we do uh, uh, we have the all optical models and do computer simulations. We have in vitro, um, in vivo work, generating the guideline, lead finally to the therapeutic. And all of these just want to bring you one message. That is, uh, if we want to have a better uh, nanotherapy efficacy, that we need to pay attention that and the, uh, the drug is carried, uh, be carried all the way by another particle. And I would like to use the chance to thank everyone that is involved in the study, uh, and especially uh, William Zahi and, and Carlos for the supervision, and Francois for all the animal work, and Brenda and her, he, her husband for the uh, computer simulation, and also I would like to thank um, Short for uh, infrared microscopy. Yeah, and thanks. All right. Thanks, Yemin, for a really nice talk, at least that's what we think. Um, <laughs> does anyone have a question? Nobody is really clear. Okay. I think um, then I'll give this to you. I don't know, actually don't know what it is. Like some cert certificate you can...